Hi. Today's video is something a little bit different and it's been a fun challenge to film. I'm interviewing author Patrick Ness. His new book Burn is out tomorrow if you're watching this on the day that it's released and this video is also sponsored by Walker Books for the release of Burn. If you've been watching my channel for a while you'll know that I've talked about Patrick's books throughout the years. I love the Chaos Walking series and yes I will be asking him about the film. I hosted a book club for his book release a few years back and some of you came to that as well. I'm always super excited when he has a new book out. It's always something totally different. This time there's dragons, the 1950s cults and a lot more. Let's get to the interview. Hi, how are you? Hi, Patrick Ness. Talking to Hi. Sana. <laughs> Hi guys. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna ask you to start off with a, a very quick intro to Burn, to just give people like a general idea of what the book is about. I mean, it's the first book I've ever written that could easily be described in one sentence. So which I always say is uh, it's 1950s America, but with dragons. And it, I mean, it, what opens a pitch. Yeah, it opens in 1957. So a girl called Sarah Dewhurst works on a farm in rural Washington state, which is where I'm from. And she and her father have, they're so poor that they've had to hire a drag. And uh, things go crazy from there. <laughs> Lots to come. I feel like it's hard to stay out of spoiler territory with this one, but we'll <laughs> try. So my first question is probably quite an obvious one, and it is, why dragons? Well, why not dragons? I mean, I've yeah. <laughs> loved dragons since I was a kid. Loved them. Not, um, there's a Disney movie in the early 80s, way, way back when I was a tiny tot, um, called Dragon Slayer. And it, it's a stop motion dragon, but it is still the, one of the very greatest movie dragons. And I loved it. And I think, I think dragons are something that we kind of place our yearning on, if you know what I mean. They're so big, so powerful. They're usually intelligent, they usually speak. I think they kind of represent everything we sort of wish we were. I've always wanted to write a book about dragons, always, and never had, a, never had an idea that I thought was worth it. And then somehow mm -hmm. 1950s America <laughs> seemed to fit. I had a question as well from someone called Leah and she said when you start writing a book do you kind of know from the start where it's going and I was also curious because you have so many different kind of worlds and concepts that you've written about in your books where does that where does that start and how do you go along with that? Oof, there's no real one way I mean I've done I've never really done full novel planning ahead of time I always like to say that I I usually have a basic idea of where the plot might go and mm. uh, I usually have a couple of big images or scenes that I okay. feel really cool but I don't know how those connect normally and I, I just kind of I don't know writing a novel is such a huge act of faith you just have to leap and you have to hope that you land on your feet and I really trusted the plot on this one you know I mean you hear you hear some writers say plot isn't important well those are writers who cannot plot <laughs> plot is plot is can be plot is as important as anything else and so i just felt like i had done two novels in a row where plot was a, a different kind of wrangle and so mm. i thought well, that's what i want a free free story one that just rolls and rolls and rolls and so that's what i just sort of jumped under the dragon's back and rode yeah because i love as well like how adventurous this is it does kind of take you everywhere and at a really quick pace which is which is really fun yeah. I, it's kind of stuff i like to read and also i always say that if you get plot working, if you get your it's machinery, and if you get it working, you can kind of ignore it in the best way because you know it's working and you know that it's there. And and mm. once it's working, then you can fill it with character and emotion and theme and all the things you care about. Um, but you need a story to do all that stuff, or it's not going to be very enjoyable to read. And then you mentioned one dragon-themed inspiration. Do you have any other things that kind of maybe you looked at while you were writing, or things that you've kind of like watched over the years, because I know I have, I was kind of thinking like, oh, have I read many dragon things, seen many dragon things? And then I went back through some of my favorite films and apparently have a huge list of dragon things that I love. So my personal favorites were always like Reign of Fire, Dragonheart, and then I read the Aragon books as well growing up. Dragonheart is maybe not the highest quality dragon film that there is. I, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> The difference between Dragonheart and Dragon Slayer, the, one, the earlier one, is that the dragon in Dragon Slayer is called, mm. the name of that dragon is Vermithrax Pejorative, which is the greatest dragon name ever. Amazing. The name of the dragon in Dragonheart is Draco. <laughs> oh, that's how hard they tried. But anyway, I mean, yeah, I mean, they do, they, they're the kind of, every culture has a dragon, every culture has a dragon. Mm -hmm. That's basic. I mean, obviously it's based on snakes, one would guess, but 
um, I don't know, there's just something that our hearts respond to and our brains respond to. And yeah. the other thing, the other thing that I, um, that is really important to this book is um, this thing I've always thought about Back to the Future, which is that Back to the Future is only a comedy if you're a straight white guy. If right. you're anybody else, you don't want to go back to the 50s. Your quality of life is going to just plummet. And so I, I, I've always wondered about that and I always thought about that because I would not be comfortable in the 50s. I'm not mm. going to be dating any boys in the 50s. And this, but of course, all of those people existed. I mean, the, Sarah has is a dual racial heritage. And uh, when I was doing some, because I have my nieces and nephews, I have eight nieces and nephews on my side, and six of them have multiracial heritage. And I, I looked up the, the law, and my home state had um, repealed the law against interracial marriage in the late 1800s. Obviously, mm-hmm. Marriages exist, those marriages existed before then, but there was enough in the late 1800s that they passed the law to re, you know, repeal it. And so where are those people? Where are those people on screen? Where are those people in stories? You know, where are those people who are the parents of you know, my nieces and nephews? And, uh, and what were their lives like in the 50s? And what were, I, I used to also work with a woman when I was in college <clears throat> who was born in a Japanese internment camp, hmm. which is a really ugly chapter of American history that we don't talk about very much. Uh, but she would tell me these stories about, she was born in a camp in California and her family, then after the war, when they were released from a prison camp for being Japanese, and that's it, Japanese American. Uh, she moved back to Los Angeles and she would tell me these stories about being a teenager in the fifties in Los Angeles, where she would, she and her friends from high school would hang around, hang out around the studios because she wanted, they wanted to meet Elvis. And they did, they met Elvis several times coming out of the studios. And I thought, well, you know, when you see, films about the 50s and 50s Hollywood, you do not see the Japanese teenage girl yeah. standing outside the studio. But there she was, living her life. And so a lot of that came from the Back to the Future thing, came from just these questions that I've always had about um, have dual racial, a racial um, parentage uh, in the 50s, or a, somebody whose parents, or maybe you were born in an internment camp, or if you were you know, like Malcolm in the book, you'd like boys. And what was that like? What was it actually like? And these people existed and they had lives and they thrived. So why don't we ever see them? It was so interesting to have both that discussion in the book and have like this great adventure and it all kind of works together really, really well. That's what I, I always think. I mean, even if you agree with every word of a sermon, you don't want to hear a sermon. Right. <laughs> no, it, I, I, working as a story is best. And I mean, pe- authors often use that phrase, well, it has to be a story first. I agree with that, but that phrase has been used to cover a multitude of sins for decades. Right. It has to be a story first. Well, that tends to mean it has to be the same story we've always seen, where it's always the right. same looking kid who has the same adventure. So it does have to be a story first, but you can't just stop there. You have to acknowledge that the world looks bigger and more colorful than you might be seeing in the books that you've read. And yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I, I believe it needs to be a story first, but you've also got to keep your eyes open. So my next question is actually from my flatmate, Rosianna, who has talked to you and interviewed you before. And she's like, <laughs> I have a question. So she's, I'm throwing that one in. Hi, Rosianna. Well, you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but she said, you know, what made the 50s the right time for this book? And did you ever start writing it at a different time or was it always the 50s? It was always the 50s because we, we I mean, when I, was, I grew up in the 80s and uh, the 80s romanticized the 50s a lot, like Back to the Future. Mm. And uh, like now kind of romanticizes the 80s. Well, you know, sure, there was, uh, you know, I enjoy the music of the 80s. I'm not, you know, held prisoner by it like a lot of people are. There were a lot of crappy things about the 80s. Yeah. And there were a lot of crappy things about the 50s. And But the 50s had, um, the 50s were coming out of World War II, but then this Cold War had begun. And uh, this war without, you know, overt weaponry. And that that was what the 80s were like. And it's kind of a little bit like what the world is now. We're not, there are wars going on, but mostly there's a lot of covert jostling. And there's a covert, mm. you know, there's a real, there's tension where there shouldn't be between um, countries that have strong men, because it's always strong, it's always men, um, as leaders. And you think, ooh, that, that, ten- that pointless tension between... American Russia is not really between American Russia, it's between Trump and Putin. And it's, you know, and, and that sort of thing, and that kind of tension where it's completely out of your control. Um, I don't know, that kind of interested me and it felt fruitful. And it felt like it's also, I, I have moved the date of Sputnik, the launch of Sputnik, the first satellite. I moved it up about 10 months, um, uh, which is fine because it's fiction. 
<laughs> but that was the year that Sputnik, that, and everything changed at Sputnik. Everything changed. When we had satellites, the world became a different place, which is like what happened when we got the internet. The world suddenly became different. So the 50s are, have a lot of corollaries between mm. uh, now and then with a lot of key differences that are interesting to explore and the intentions that are interesting to explore. I don't think I've read any YA books set during that time. And so I think it was, it was really fun to both explore history and, and have that as the, as the setting. And yeah, something I'd love to read more about as well. Yes, perhaps it's the closest I'll ever get to a historical novel, I think. <laughs> so next question is from Peter McMillan and he asked, and I'm very curious about this as well, which character or point of view was the most challenging to write? Because there's a bunch of different characters, different points of views, and it, it switches quite a lot. So what was kind of the, the trickiest one or the trickiest part of that? Probably Sarah, um, and not for the reasons you might think, um, because Sarah, for a, a lot of the book, is waiting. And there, that's on purpose, um, because a lot of being a teenager is waiting. And that, uh, that's compelling to me, where you are, you don't have the power that you feel like you should. Hmm. But that to make that interesting, to make that compelling, is really challenging, because um, Malcolm moves, and the FBI agents move, and there's there's movement, and uh, uh, and I can, that's you know that's fun. Um, Sarah is sort of slowly chafing against um, these circumstances and wondering why she can't break out. I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit about Malcolm, maybe, because we haven't really touched upon maybe that side of the story as much yet, which is probably one of my favorites. Yeah, Malcolm is there in this world of the 50s with dragons. There is a cult that has uh, popped up called the Believers, and they are, they worship dragons, more or less, which to me is really interesting, because I always wondered the question of, if you could see your God every day flying around, what would <laughs> that be about faith? You know, what would that, how would you, especially if that, especially if they ignored you, um, which is the thing that dragons do mostly. And, uh, and it also, um, I mean, I wasn't raised in a cult, but I was raised in a quite a strict evangelical church. And there is mm -hmm. such an interesting moment that we all do in one way or another in our teenage years, where you realize that you are different from what you've been taught. And that can be a positive thing. That can be a negative thing. That can be just an interesting thing. It can be an additional thing or where you step away from your family and say, I'm no longer this, I am something else. And how that can change everything. And mm -hmm. um, Malcolm believes he's completely in the right. He seems like a nice kid. He just has a mission to kill somebody. <laughs> and he believes it's right. And there's a sentence where he meets Nelson and Nelson is a, Nelson is a boy he happens to meet on the road. And uh, there's a sentence in the book where it says, uh, something like he stepped into the, the, the to the campfire area and met Nelson and thus the fate of billions was changed. And that to me is so interesting. Next questions are, I guess, a bit more general, just about your writing yep. and the future and things like that. I've read a wide selection of your books and I'm always curious, I think when I read multiple books by authors, what in their mind is maybe the thing that is the thread that runs through them. Cause obviously your books are like very different. And I was wondering, are there any themes or things that you always find yourself coming back to, maybe intentionally, maybe not? It's usually unintentional. I mean, I usually, because I mean, I never notice until after everything's done. I mean, I didn't notice well until sort of, gosh, past more than this, which is my fifth YA book hmm. and my seventh book overall, where I realized that I was writing a lot about what, how to survive at the end of the world. <laughs> and this, you know, this theory that the world is ending all the time. And so, yeah. uh, so it's not about the world ending. It's about what you do when it does and how do you start a new life in a new world. And Cast Walking is about that. Monster Calls is about that more than this is about that. The rest of us just live here is not. I don't know. I mean, I, like I said, I was raised by quite apocalyptic Christians and uh, yeah. the, they were always talking about the end of the world. So it, it gets in there, but it's more, it's the metaphorical one. Because when you're a teenager, everything feels like it's about to end. And you're right. It is. <laughs> everything is frequently and uh, it's about how you deal with that, and how you reckon with it, and how you start again. So that's this is kind of the same. This is really about restarts and um, doing things differently if you had a second chance, and uh, and what that means, what that costs, what the positives are, um, because all you really got in the end is yourself and the things that you've learned along the way. I always want to be scared. I always want to do something different. I always want to worry yeah. that I'm really screwed up. So I don't want to, never want to do the same thing again. 
And then of course the question that I know everyone will want me to ask, uh, and that is any updates on the Chaos Walking film or anything you can share with us? And it's really funny because I get um, I get on Instagram especially I get give us chaos walking content I'm like as if I'm in <laughs> as if I'm the one who is holding it from you I mean like if, if I had content that I could share with you I would share it so date is January twenty first when it's going to come out um, and uh, I am seeing another version of it probably within a week with oh uh, wow special effects added so uh, mm -hmm. so I've seen a final cut it's good. I've seen um, some special effects tests, which are really cool. And so when they put it all together, I think it's going to be really good. So that's what I can tell. Amazing. That's great. My final question is, what is next? What else are, are you working on? Because I know you're also working on Lord of the Flies, if I'm correct. Yes, I am writing a new version of Lord of the Flies for Luca Guadagnino, who directed Call Me By Your Name and Suspiria. Mm -hmm. I love and I, uh, those, those films, The Bigger Splash. I have a couple of other things in the works for television that are secret at the moment. Um, I have another project that is completely different than any of those things that I cannot say yet, but I'm dying to tell the world when I can. Okay. Uh, but I, and I haven't, I haven't started another book. I've got a kind of a vague idea possibly for another book. Um, but I figure it's number 12. I've done 12 books in 13 years. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. I think I can, I think I'm just going to wait until the right one pops in my head. Um, it'll come. Lord of the Flies is what my attention is focused on quite a lot. Um, so in this time of quarantine, because we're filming this still in quarantine, yep. which is why my hair is this long, uh, and because uh, it's never this long. But uh, so I'm writing about um, a dystopian society collapsing. Hooray! It's cheering. All right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with thank me through the magic of the internet, because yep. we were originally going to see each other in person, but obviously yeah. not possible at the moment. I was supposed to be on tour starting today, I think, more or less in the UK. But oh, well, yeah. sorry, I'll see you soon. I promise. Thanks so much for chatting to me, Patrick. And um, I'll see you guys soon. Do we? Thanks a lot. Thank you. How do I do that for me? We'll do. Bye bye. <laughs>